She was from Indo Canadian descent. Uh, for a year, and, year or so ago, she <coughs> approached me in our other uh, location that we do this presentation, my familiar presentation at Adler School downtown. And because I usually film this and <coughs> volunteer in the group, she came to me and she said, Well, why, when are you going to present? And I'm thinking, Well, what do you want me to present on? Well, on, the, on us, on us, on immigrants. And I'm saying, Oh, okay, you know, why not? Well, what would you like to, you know, what, what, what about us? She said, well, our life is so hard, it's so hard, it's so tough. And, and I said, yes, it is, but there's lots of joy in it, too. And she said, joy? Tell me one good thing about it. Tell me one joyful thing. And I said, okay, see you in a year. See you in a, see you in a year. So I don't know, it's just uh, she, she around or not. So the part of this presentation I definitely want to dedicate to her, to other people who actually wanted to um, express the, um, on their feedback forms, you know, what kind of presentation wanted to, they want to hear. So you do have feedback for, forms too. So if you're interested in any other topics outside immigration or whatever, please put it on. We will look for uh, presenters. So now you know how it all began. <laughs> why I'm talking about, why I'm saying joy versus happiness is, uh, is because I see joy as a verb, not as a noun. 
And I guess I, I can do that uh, because, you know, um, what you can do, don't say she's yourself, you know, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Well, I think I do about the joy because joy is a process. Joy is, is a, a many, the joy encompasses many things rather than happiness. Happiness is something that is more personal and there is, it's more, um, uh, when you ask people, are you, are, do you feel happy, are you happy? They will usually answer to you based on uh, how they feel at the moment, and 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 then you got this big answer. Um, you got the answer on something that you know they may change their mind later on. You know, but joy. Uh, there's several components of joy that I will focus talk more about in the presentation. So we're gonna start this presentation with. Uh, like a clip, it's a very small clip, and I, I promise it's going to be small. Uh, nobody's going to get hurt, just so you know. <laughs> Some of you probably already know where I'm going with that. And if you don't, then you are free to go on YouTube later and, and uh, Google this comedian uh, yourself, because uh, I can't really put a whole, um, even this whole joke on it, because it's, it's a little bit too free speech. Um, and I know that's very important that I actually make disclaimer that what you're going to see in this uh, clip is really my choice to put it in. It's my presentation. It doesn't reflect PCACC, it doesn't reflect MCFD, my employer, or my association. It's really me making this choice to illustrate stereotypes, to illustrate fun and joy and growth and, and ability to laugh at yourself, you know, like challenge challenge assumptions and and and, and, and laugh at yourself. That's part of the joy. Of, uh, joy. So, uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the statistics and then what I'm really talking about, you know, what, what immigrants, voluntary and involuntary, you know, people who actually some, some they have choice and actually most of the people you would think would have choice, but you know, lots of people don't have choice. They, this, this is a country that was offered to them uh, in their refugee camp or wherever they've been, and uh, they, 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 the choice was I go or I stay and in a, for another 10 years in a camp that doesn't offer me anything, and uh, or I just uh, try. So, and I'm also going to talk about everything I'm going to talk, you know, I will most likely use this the terms of acculturally, acculturation. I can pronounce when I need it. And lived experience, well-being, and this kind of terms, you know, like, so just, uh, I just want to make sure that we understand, that you understand what I'm talking about, what I mean when I say this. And then, of course, you know, I'm going to talk about prerequisites um, for joy, some uh, components. And uh, hopefully I will have time uh, to talk a little bit about the application for counseling. Uh, usually this room is filled half a half, half with council, half with community members. So uh, I think it's, and even if you're not counselor, you know, like I think it's it's good to, for 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 you for people who are not counselors to know actually what they should look in counselor, if they have they want to go into uh, find a counselor. So I think it's it's a good thing to know actually what is out there and, and what is what. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't talk too much, but I will show you what I mean by that. And, and, most, and, and also the other very important thing you should know is everything I say here um, is based on, on a few things. Research, research, my lived experience, lived experience of my clients or my friends and family. So unless I, I say that it's my experience or experience of my friend, it is research based. Um, this presentation will be posted on my website. It, Next, next weekend, by next weekend for sure, and you because I couldn't fit actually a list of resources where I got all this information for on, on PowerPoint. So you will have it there, and you can go there. And some names I already brought, so you can Google them, because there's some really interesting research actually available there. Um, some that I, I was really impressed. Uh, just one that just came into in January of this year, done in BC. So it's. I hope really that this hour or so will be worth of your time. And also, if at any point of time you feel that you want to uh, share something or I trigger you in some way, I 
and you want to say something, you want to comment, uh, please do so. Uh, it's uh, uh, we are a small group, and I'm sure we, we're going to have enough time. And you know, slides uh, will go, and I, I, and I don't need to do them all as long as we capture what I uh, said. Uh, that I will please try to capture. So let's go to Mr. Peterson for just a few minutes. There's one thing that separates immigrant families from the regular Canadian families. You know, doesn't matter where your parents are from. They weren't born in this country. They will whoop your ass when you're growing up. Won't they? <laughs> Ukraine, you know what I'm saying? They'll beat you with a cabbage roll. You know what I'm saying? They'll smack a pierogi upside your head. They'll beat you, right? Immigrant parents will beat their kids. Canadian parents are a little too soft on the kids, and that's fine. You know, whatever makes you happy. But you need to start beating kids. I'll tell you why. Is growing up. Kids now are growing up in a multicultural society. You know, you're going to have white kids growing up with black kids and brown kids and Asian kids, and they're all going to be hanging out in the playground. You know what I mean? And they're going to be talking about the ass whooping they got last night. Do you want that little white kid to feel left out? <laughs> Beat that child so he's not a social outcast. <laughs> we'll be sitting around playing, my dad beat my ass. My dad beat my ass too! Well, I can be like, I got sent to my room. Well, I'll be like, you got a room? <laughs> <laughs> you need to beat the kids, man. Indian parents will beat their kids. Chinese parents, you, I would hate to get beat. Your parents know Kung Fu and stuff, man. Oh. I would hate to mess up with the Chinese, you know what I'm saying? Hey! Check this phone! It says you got an F in school. <laughs> they wouldn't even need to beat you. They'd go, oh, no, 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 Indian parents will beat their kids. Indian parents aren't afraid to kill their kids if they have to. <laughs> My dad's theory was, if I get rid of one, I'll just make another one. <laughs> I never build a new one, but Indian hit the last one was. <laughs> Jamaican parents will beat their kids for no reason sometimes, won't they? Hey, why? Come here. Yes, daddy? <laughs> What's that for? Just in case. <laughs> White people, please beat your kids. I'll tell you what else, because when I was growing up, right, I grew up around a lot of black people, which was fine, because black people never picked them. White kids, not so friendly. But every now and then, a white kid would come and hang out with us. And we were like, wow, a white kid! I heard so much about you! <laughs> and here's where the problem is. When a white kid would hang out with us, we'd want to be like the white kid. We would want to start to do everything like the white kid. We wanted to copy that white kid so much. <coughs> and the problem is, is when we would start taking that white kid's advice on how to deal with our parents. That'll get you freaking murdered, man. <laughs> I remember hanging around this one little white boy, Ryan, when I was 10 years old. I went to his house after school one day, right? His parents... I, I, can, I think I have to stop with Ryan. I know it's, it's really good, but it's, he uses really colorful language after that. And um, it's funny, so I, I won't go there. It's funny, but it's your choice. You can watch it on YouTube. Why I choose this clip? Uh, as Deb said, I'm a social worker. <laughs> I work with immigrants. I work with everyone and anyone who needs help of some kind uh, from provincial government. And I'm also a therapist. Uh, so uh, when I when and I and I and I get this every day from people, and it's part of you know when once when you come to that point that you can laugh about it, you know you do. You know you are actually 
past the, the troubles, you're, you're towards the, the joy and you're towards the healing and everything else. Um, so I, I just thought this would be funny. So do you find it funny or do you find it offensive? I love it. it okay? Have you seen it before? No? Yeah? <laughs> so maybe, yeah. Yeah, he was in Vancouver a few times and GM plays for pool. Um, and you can imagine that people actually like to laugh at themselves. Okay, so let's go to Stats Canada. So uh, some of the numbers that are 2010 and some are most recent. So when we talk about numbers, like you can see just for yourself, to over 2,800,000 uh, per year. So the three, four major classes actually. Family class is the most uh, uh, frequent, I guess. Uh, the family class really includes relatives and, 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 uh, and uh, immediate family that are easiest to bring into country once when you're in a country already. Um, and uh, then we have economic class, which really includes uh, business immigration, what, I, what we call it now, VIP, business immigrant program is, is the latest program. The government, federal government, came up with, and uh, skilled workers. Uh, they also belong into economic class. Uh, the refugees are uh, they're coming in in huge numbers, uh, and, and why? I mean, I don't think so. I need to tell you why. But those it, this this group is the most uh, um, studied in research, and uh, they need most help, as as you can imagine. So there you go. It's every year we have almost nine, uh, nine thousand people escaping persecution, torture, war, atrocities, and what's not. And most recently, our government said they're going to actually um, double that number. Um, so we can expect more and more uh, people uh, coming to Vancouver. Actually, Toronto, as you know, Toronto and Vancouver are the most. Uh, uh, to the biggest city, taking the numbers, the larger number of immigrants. Uh, and just, uh, uh, I mean, uh, information of the, uh, we, we, lots of people come to Vancouver, but then they, they frequent down to Fraser. Uh, and there's Fraser over the, across the river, and um, there's not much services there, but there is more and more again. Uh, in work, there's lots of services in work there. Why don't they go to other parts of Canada where they would be really well? Yeah, and you know why? It's I always you know because the the, the other parts of Canada uh, they don't have uh, uh, it's cold for one thing. There's not Toronto's cold. They they are in Toronto. They are in Toronto, larger number than. I think maybe it'd be a requirement by the government that they spread out. They, they do, they, and they, they are some, you know, and yeah. actually it's happening. Once when you apply from outside the country, you actually have much better chance if you uh, are willing to live in less developed or, or less populated parts of Canada. But then uh, people do that, and there are some requirements for a few years, and after a few, a few years they uh, go to, um, they come to the You get a lot of benefits yeah. if you go to Saskatchewan. <laughs> so now you know the guilty ones uh, um, who just sneaked in and think it's all fine. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, I already said that you guys are late, so just so you know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, I, I, I'm sure. I hope you find this amazing. So according to Stats Canada, by by 2031, more, most of our population, more than a half, will be foreign-born, or at least have one foreign-born parent. And of course, you know, like uh, white people will be my, uh, minority, not my majority. And uh, again, I don't think so. I, I mean, this is just uh, this is the stats. But what I'm thinking, yeah, uh, when you look into uh, Family tree, uh, it would be a mix of uh, races. It would be very hard to say. It would be very hard to say. Oh, this is just uh, I don't know one group that got particular I don't know uh, cultural makeup. I see this from generation that I I mean my, from my son and all the friends and all the people around. They are. Uh, 
they're color free, they're race free, they're like prejudice free, and everything that uh, some generations back were not. And that's in my opinion, of course. So what stats tells us? There you go. See, oh, I was chatting with my friend Stell at the back, and we were talking about the uh, because I know this accent. I mean, uh, there's British accent, and there is which other accent, uh, like a, a young couple, uh, and uh, and I'm always uh, amazed with that because uh, uh, because I immigrated when I was, you know, like I don't know, I of course it was a mature, you know, like, and oh yeah, I forgot to tell you that part. I will come to that. Um, it always amazes me, you know, like that young people. Um, choose to, to leave and then and, and choose to different country than they uh, were born in. Um, and that again speaks, that's a, that speaks about, at the beginning what I said is involuntary and voluntary immigration. And that's what, what is, um, I believe, very, very, very important to distinguish here. So, uh, interesting part is I'm particularly connected to UK because uh, Love of my life is from UK and uh, recent immigrant, just 2006. I don't know which year did you guys come in? Two years ago. Two years ago, there you go. Um, so, uh, UK immigration uh, is uh, just ninth on the list. Now, uh, the numbers uh, are really changing uh, because we have a higher number of American immigrants than just after South Asian and Asian uh, population. So I think it's really amazing, the number, they're number five on the list. People from my country, um, after them, people from Europe, France, but people from my country are at the bottom of the list. And um, like really, like it's just few thousands per year, really few thousands per year. The most people from where I'm from, and from uh, former Yugoslavia, uh, more precisely from Croatia, we came in the late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s, uh, during the civil war in, in old Yugoslavia. Um, and um, so I just, I just felt that was kind of an interesting point to make. Um, so there you go. So we go to what I was, I was trying to emphasize all along is when we talk about mental health or well being or anything else, you really have to, and we are about immigrants, period. We really have to be minded of, are those voluntary or, or involuntary people, uh, migrants coming? And it's important because choice is involved. It's really about the choice, because see, what I say here is involuntary immigrants were pushed out, but, and voluntary immigrants were pulled in because of the skills, because of the, uh, whatever they had, uh, uh, I mean, uh, investors, you name it, they're pulled in. They have lots of choice. But people who suffer, so who left uh, because of civil war, and uh, um, you, I wrote the civil war, nothing civil about the civil war. I mean, that's another topic, but there's nothing civil about civil war. And I come from, from one of those uh, areas. Um, so there you go, involuntary immigrants are most uh, likely affected by severe physical, social, economic factors. And, uh, and most of them uh, have no uh, way of returning. Um, and that's, that's another, I hope I will not forget to mention why is this so important uh, for people uh, well-being and healing, the ability to, to return or at least to visit. So, um, uh, as you see, you know, like voluntary, voluntary immigrants are generally more, more um, hope, uh, optimistic and they have more uh, opportunities. But again, uh, speaking at, at friends and everyone else, they, everyone says, Susanna, we are all in the same boat. We are all competing for the same resources. You know? So it's hard to say, I mean, as an immigrant, I would, I would definitely say, no, 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 we, we, it's harder for us, you know? But you know what? I, Ten years later, I would probably say, yeah, it's, it's kind of there, you know. But when, when, when we bring up immigration, uh, sorry, refugee issues, then we're no longer on the same, uh, on the 
on the same page. It's a completely different issue. Okay, so, but, uh, yeah, as I said earlier, I wanted to um, just clarify what I mean by acculturation, you know? Like, acculturation is something, but it's a term that we refer to, um, uh, for, uh, refers to mutual change that happens in uh, um, Canadian people born in Canada and to us. It's, it's a process that um, I usually, I like to uh, illustrate with a uh, ripple effect. It's like when you when you put a stone in a, in a water, you know, like and there's, there's little you know circles around, you know, like you see that, that, that they're changing and they're mixing and they, they, they kind of become one one big kind of wave, and that's what's happening to all of us because just the fact that we came in doesn't mean only that we uh, have we are we are the one who need to change. We are we are the one who's changing. It's not. Everyone around us, people who live here for generations are changing with us because of us and with us and at the same time we're changing because of them with them so so that's why I mean it's it's, it's a really long uh, process and, and it's personal and it takes uh, a, a different uh, shape in different times of people's lives and things along those lines um, Culture, as you know, is a human creation and a socially constructed uh, concept uh, that uh, we, we like to hang to it and that divide, defines us in some respect as well. Um, and, and the other concept that I like to use is the concept of well-being. Um, it's, uh, it's a theory of choice that is compri comprised with these five major components. It's a positive emotions and engagement attachment, uh, sorry, uh, accomplishment, um, uh, creating meanings, and creating positive relationships. So that's uh, also for me, in my, in my theory, is it's that well-being is really a uh, prerequisite for joy. And, and, and that's why it's so important to me important that happiness, which is temporary and affected by how we feel at the moment. OK, so. Uh, just, uh, I think I'm gonna speed up a little bit, <laughs> but uh, still hopefully cover everything because I'm really hoping that if, if I say anything that it triggers you, please, please uh, cut me off or, or, or jump in and uh, stuff. let me know how you feel about it. So, uh, as I said, uh, mental health of refugees is, is most unique uh, kind of. Uh, area that, that needs attention, but it's also most researched. And unfortunately, all the research, I mean, I, I done this, I first started doing this research in 2012 as a part of my master thesis. Just, on, I was just focusing on refugees, and in particular refugees from my home country, because I wanted to know what made some of these people so successful, and, and why some uh, really had to go back, even though if it meant that would be further uh, um, abused, scrutinized, and maybe even killed. So um, uh, that, that's, when, that's when I find out that um, most of literature was really focusing on, on what was not working, uh, focusing on, on uh, uh, war trauma and uh, adjustments. Uh, lots and lots of research is done, and you wouldn't believe, like uh, in Canada, most of researchers are like states. Very, there are some research in states, but not uh, nowhere near as much as Canada and Australia. Um, some European countries are recently doing a uh, lot little more research. Uh, but um, so um, speaking about uh, the as, as I said, you know, like uh, like uh, trauma and severe, severe, uh, severe stress and uncertainty about the future is something that. Uh, deeply defines uh, uh, people, uh, re refugee people. Uh, I have personal uh, personal issues with civil war and, and uh, ethnic wars. And, uh, and uh, just as side notes, uh, just so you know, it made a huge number of people uh, feels uh, and share these feelings with me. The healing process <coughs> for, for takes a years. Uh, because civil wars are the most atrocious, they're the most um, uh, cruelest wars that you can imagine. 
um, and they really tend to destroy uh, people's uh, sense of uh, who they are, uh, the trust, uh, destroy, destroy the families. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the things, you know, like that um, takes years to, to overcome. It actually took me over 10 years, so I don't need to tell you anything more about it, I guess. Uh, that. So, there you go. We go uh, mental health in modern immigrants, PTSD all over the place. <coughs> PTSD, uh, I always say thanks God for paying some uh, wonder cock and his research because I, I love his work because he, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can't possibly summarize this <laughs> in my ESL. I would probably read this, the, 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 the last part, but it's really, I mean, what he showed in, in research is that it's not PTSD itself. It, it, it is symptoms uh, of depression, anger, outbursts, self-destructive behaviors, and, and feelings, uh, deep feelings of shame, guilt, um, blame. Um, and distrust would make a, that significant difference in how people perceive their lives and how well they cope with traumatic events. So if you're looking into uh, learning more about trauma, really, uh, Basil van der Kolk is, is the most, uh, 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 actually, he did a, one of the researchers that actually started all this work like over 30 years ago. And his book, recent book, is written in really, really a, a simple language um, and it's called I think a body keeps score the body keeps score or something like that the body keeps scores yeah talking about sensory uh, trauma uh, effects and, and healing and, and basically gives us all a very nice history of trauma and, um, and uh, how to work with, uh, with traumatic uh, experiences um, so there you go uh, here we go to voluntary immigrants uh, and their mental health. So um, this is the study that I mentioned to you at first, and it's uh, it's really interesting. They they did uh, this in, in BC, uh, and uh, they they studied actually South Asian. Uh, uh, did I brought? Uh, oh yeah. Uh, so. I didn't know that. Hmm. It's that there's actually um, a large number of South Asian youth um, that went in through, through survey to, to find about um, um, settlement and, and issues that are uh, relevant to, to settlement process. So immigrants that were not the involuntary, were voluntary people coming through families and, and uh, through other means. So. Uh, it showed, uh, as I'm sure you expected this, that the recent immigrants youth showed high uh, odds of emotional dis distress. But what, what actually was the most uh, really uh, uh, warming fact was that family connectedness and school connectedness uh, uh, was very, uh, actually uh, mitigating those odds of extreme stress and despair among boys and girls. Uh, the study also pointed out that one of two immigrant families live in poverty and um, for at least the first five years. Interestingly enough, um, in previous studies, I, I came across information that said uh, how many years it takes immigrants to actually to get, to understand what, what happened to them, you know, once when you plugged in a different world, you know, like, uh, so uh, statistics like, I guess, so I said apparently four to five years, you know. And when I talked to people that I actually interviewed, I said, does it make sense to you? And they said, you know, pretty much, you know, like I, I can say that I, I would, I saw, you know, like some like light at the end of the tunnel after four or five years, you know, like, and I guess during those years, people get acquainted with the culture, with the language, with where they live and what's not. Yes, I wonder how people in the audience relate to that number of years. Does that sound pretty familiar? Four or five years to kind of reset? Yeah, I, th I think so because, like, yeah, you have to adjust with your education, mm -hmm. and then you need to volunteer to get mm -hmm. to gain mm -hmm. um, 
the experience, like because you need to get your people to know you and and then upgrade, upgrade, and upgrade. You know, like because you're not good enough, kind of. So yeah, takes that much. You know, and, and it's the thank you, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, I it's it's really like it's. As I mentioned earlier, you know, like I got this particular interest to find, you know, to, to learn why some people are successful, why, why others are less successful. I, um, I found that people who invited change in their life were more successful. Because yes. I've lived in Absolutely. other countries and I just love the yes. change. Yes. And I love learning and yes. going back yes. and changing. I like evolving yes. and moving yes. and being a different person. Yes. But there's some people that don't. Yes. They hang on to their old self that yes. was in Croatia yes. or elsewhere. Yes. You're absolutely right. right. You're yes. absolutely right. They're most like their blogs out there, you know, mm -hmm. young people traveling the world and they spend a number of years in one country. And then they, they write about a personal growth. It really is an ex expenditure expansion of, of, of self and, and in, in feeling like a, I could come to that, but thank you for this. Well, they look at it as a wonderful opportunity as opposed to a punishment. Yes, exactly. So and, 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 and you know, and I, yeah, it takes years. It really takes years for people who are pushed out of their own home countries, you know, like to actually come to the point that, that to accept that this is a new reality, that's the one that I actually have choice right now and power to do something about it. I can't do anything about the past, but I can do something. So it takes time for that. Um, thank you for that. Uh, this study for 2011 from UK, I find it amazing uh, because it's uh, really economics, money, because people immigrate because of money too, you know, makes more money in certain countries. It doesn't make you any happier. Like we, we, this is quite consistent with the, with the previous research that generally money cannot make you happy. It can make you happy for a certain period of time until you, you know, like. But then after that, you are the same miserable person as you were before you got that money. So interestingly enough, you know, like going just because of money to another country doesn't doesn't do you any good. So a little bit about commonalities and differences of lived experiences. And it goes. Uh, what you were just towards what you were saying. Um, all, what you need to both groups is uh, they are both looking for a better life. Um, the means how to get to get there and how to do that is a little bit means are a little bit di different. They all have existential questions and uh, grief and loss and, and nostalgia is present everywhere. But what's what I found in, in, with people um, who lost. Uh, um, who actually uh, didn't think they would need to leave their homes and everything they ever knew. Um, they, they, they have a little bit different view of this. Uh, they, I mean, this is a little bit, I mean, I, I'm a little bit, I have to, I, when I do this and I prepare, prepare, prepare this all by myself, it was, it was all okay, but now when I'm looking at this in, in, to you and you witnessing what I'm saying, it's it's a little bit harsh on me, so um, and I hope it's okay with you because uh, somebody at the beginning of the presentation asked me, am I expert in uh, or not an expert? Am I is this my um, uh, speciality or something? Do I this is what I do? And my answer was uh, uh, no, not really. The only I don't ever claim. I mean, I work with immigrants, of course, but. It's not my expertise. The only expertise I have is my lived experience. And that is the one of involuntary, uh, uh, involuntary experience. I love Canada. I, I call the, Canada is my home. Uh, and it's a very proud Canadian. One of those that will tell you, you know, what's wrong with you. Know, like, I mean, if you don't go you know, in Canada Day and do stuff. Uh, just kidding, OK? Uh, but it's hard to look at this and, and, and stand and say, oh my goodness, is this really what I all went through this? And is this still going on? Because lots of people that, that I research myself and I find information in research are like really long for closure. And lots of people uh, uh, like get into great desperate until they achieve that closure. And, and some people actually 
can move forward, can experience and enjoy in you were referring and, and, and making those choices until they go back and, and put this things into perspective, leave past to past and move forward. Um, so yeah, of course, they talk about sense of powerlessness stuff, sadness, worries, hopelessness. And that's, I underline this because when I was doing first time around my research on this, this is what people are talking about, sadness. They don't talk about depression. They don't talk about PTSD. They talk about nostalgia. They talk about losses. They talk about grief, you know. PTSD, uh, of course, it's present and it, it's more prevalent uh, for some people. Um, but it's not all that is for involuntary immigrants as well. Okay. What else I wanted to say about this? Well, identity reconstruction uh, uh, goes uh, for both sides. Personal growth goes both sides. But again, on the other side, involuntary immigrants, again, Uh, confusion, disbelief, humiliation, shame, and blame. That is that majority of refugees will talk to you about for some time. Uh, they will feel powerless. They won't trust anyone. Uh, they will have a, a great disconnection with, with everything that uh, they knew about. I, I, as a social worker, of course, I'm bringing up issues of parenting and uh, violence in the home, domestic violence and, and things like that. Um, people talk about loss of ethnic and cultural identity. So that's when identity construction is, is a quite uh, important concept to introduce. Um, personal and post-traumatic growth um, is again, it's prevalent as well, but again, it takes years, it takes time for that. This process is much faster with voluntary immigrants for obvious reasons. Um, so, uh, just uh, briefly about to, to, to put this into perspective, uh, what, what do we really need to experience joy? There are two, two distinct stuff. Socio, socio cultural, pre and post immigration factors are one thing, psychological the other. At the same time, you know, they intersect and they um, become our lived, uh, they become our reality. What I want to focus is more on psychological uh, uh, stuff, the sense of belonging, attachment style, resilience, personal family strengths, attitude, and, and as a result, is post-traumatic growth. That's uh, what we really need uh, for successful acculturation, a successful process of uh, integration in society. What's up, did I say that? Yes. No, I was wondering about the group then. What did they do about uh, feeling more belonging? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, well, let's, let's, let's talk about belonging. Thank you, Joanne. Like, <laughs> hey, let's talk about belonging, exactly, because that's, that's a concept that um, lots of people came to me and said uh, they, that's always great, you know, they got this, this, and that, but there's something is missing, something is missing. And they're almost embarrassed to say, I don't feel like I belong. So why not? Why don't you belong? Well, there are factors that are coming. <laughs> I have a helpers, and I am, uh, um, I'm talking too much, am I? Nope. No, no, no. That's great. So, okay. Uh, and like, please jump in. I, I, I would, I have to hold my mouth. The a camera, I'm usually the camera, you know, like, and, and we are presenters, and people are um, asking questions, and then I have to be quiet because I would be yes. I have a question. Rather than when the large group, when you talk about it takes years <coughs> to get used to older immigrants middle-aged the kids I would think that the young people it would be a little quicker than you bring yes. the grandparents yes. over and for them to yes. give up have closure and then yeah. come back which would add stress on yeah. you yeah you, you you're absolutely right they do and some people make a choice uh, in, in this social like age 
a language education, all this stuff, are, are, all these things are uh, part of the package, you know, how fast you want to integrate or belong uh, to. But um, you're right, you know, like uh, some people, uh, older, older adults, and not all. See, that's interesting. Some, some would go. I mean, I, I'm, I have lots of people like friends whose have grandparents. I mean, parents. Pardon me, not grandparents. Their parents might be about what, 70 years old, 65 years, 70, over 70. They go to school. They want to learn ling ling uh, language, language, <laughs> English. I guess it was supposed to be. They want to learn. They want to socialize. You know, like. But other people simply choose not to because it's too intimidating. Uh, uh, again, people of my generation had no choice of not to get integrated because they have, when they came, they, they had little kids or they were bringing families or, or raising families and um, they had to keep moving and uh, catching up as much as they could. So that, that definitely affects sense of belongings. But there are other, um, uh, like this, this um, what I wanted to, you to, if you can remember from this, is uh, it's a 2004 study of Yugoslavia refugee in the United States, which they clearly identified two different stages, and it's adaptation stage and belonging stage. You know, people, uh, as what I was mentioning, you know, like they go to school, you know, like they want to do something, it still doesn't mean they belong, but they're making steps. They have intention, you know, like to, to be part of this beautiful society, to do something with their lives and stuff. But for refugees, adaptation stages cause grief, grief, sadness, humiliation. I mean, if my father came to visit, sorry, to stay with me, and I noticed that, he was ashamed that he couldn't speak. And I, and I couldn't explain to him that the half of population cannot speak proper English, you know? Like, and, and it didn't matter to him, you know? Like, because for, for his uh, face saving and, and his culture, you know, like he wanted to be able to um, communicate with other people and he couldn't and, and that brings a sense of inferiority and, and, and feeling of belonging nowhere is really I, I came across this and it's really um, sad to see uh, like uh, among Israeli um, refugee Israel, Israeli people uh, Palestinian Israeli people uh, wherever they go uh, for generations they don't remember peace they're born in war, they grow up in war, they marry, they die in war. And when you ask them, where do you belong? They belong to war, you know? That's giving me chills, you know, like, because this is, this is really, a, a, this is huge. But see, once when we crossed uh, uh, this immigrant study, like, uh, they really, um, there are a huge number of Bosnian, actually, refugees, and I'm sure that you, you heard about atrocities back. Uh, then uh, in the uh, so-called genocide of between uh, what's happened in Bosnia and once when they were so-called safe and, and all was supposed to be great in the United States, um, they had a really hard time to, to develop a sense of belonging. But once they, when they did, this is how they dis describe it, like restore the ability to know this beauty, sense of normalcy in their new lives, freedom and hope for a better life. So there you go. Uh, and then the last sentence, I think I just said what I, what I said, it's belonging is unique to all of us human beings. We want to all belong somewhere. You know, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a human need. And when I mean, you come to country and you don't feel like you belong for a long time, you know, like it can cost you lots of mental anguish. Okay, the other component is secure attachment. You, you were right on why some people do, why some people don't. It is, uh, it's really related to attachment. People with, with secure attachment, it's way easier to, to find a new attachment figures, a new, uh, develop new role, new connections. It's much easier than people who actually uh, came out a little bit, uh, I mean, differently. Um, so as, as this is all research-based, you know, like uh, there is a real link between attachment anxiety and PTSD, PTSD symptoms. Secure attachment can help people work through trauma, of 
course, we, we know that. So interesting that I mean, it, it, uh, the research on, on men uh, refugees, uh, see they, they reported uh, secure attachment to the general more post-traumatic growth. You know what, what, what I find in the studies is that even a little bit of sense of control, even if people who were like men refugees or men refugees in camps, outside Canada, kind of before they came, if they had a little bit of perceived sense of control, they did so much better that PTSD symptoms were way lower than for ones that they felt that they had absolutely no control in anything. But, uh, collective identity is something, I mean, this, this is, I mean, this is a too short presentation to talk about collective identity, but it is a strength and it is a part of attachment and people from collective uh, cultures are mostly coming here and they tend to create that um, kind of group, but as long as they can find that group safely and, and it takes time for all of that. Um, resilience, there you go. I'm not going to go into definitions of this and we recently had a great presentation of the Amish and believe she did a great uh, presentation of uh, how to support your resilience and how to um, make your help yourself be more resilient but again research shows that there is a reciprocal uh, kind of um, relationship that's happening um, uh, with re re refugee families and the whole host countries so um, People, um, uh, yeah, I, I write much better than I talk, don't I? <laughs> I wanted to say that the resilient, resilient refugees really report um, having a sense of continu continuity with their past and a faith shared with the entire community. So again, I'm talking about collective uh, mindset. Um, so uh, people, reach into what they know uh, from, from what they grow up in, into their own um, uh, culture, uh, like collective sense of uh, connectedness. Again, uh, resilience can be supported by a variety of factors, uh, but without uh, going into community, finding those factors, those uh, connections, uh, nothing really happens. So identity reconstruction, I think it's really, uh, um, and we need to talk about this more because um, that's what I was, when I was talking about acculturation, you know, like, and uh, and what happens to people because, uh, as I said, we, we influence each other. Uh, in its process of influencing each, each other, we construct something new. We, we, we um, construct the, create a new sense of self, new meanings. You, you, you create a new story, create stories. We create uh, new realities for ourselves. So reconstruct, identity reconstruction is um, really self-reflective process, but it's, it's also flexible and it's change over time, changes over time. Uh, you know, the, the, when I was mentioning to, uh, referring to my son and his generation, the friends that were coming to, home, to his home and things like that, um, I was always amazed, you know, like about the connection that they were making with, um, they wanted to know about my culture or they were talking about their, their parents and grandparents and I was just looking at them and it, to me it was just most amazing and at the same time, they were speaking with no accent, they were using all the terms and all the slangs that I never could pick up and in this all this past and I was and I was saying, what is it this? And and, um, and and I and I would make jokes like I tried to that I would attempt to make jokes. But I was always uh, told, you know, like, Mom, what's wrong with you? Be proud with your culture, you know, why are you so tough on your culture? Like be proud with your culture, it's okay. And I'm thinking what are you talking about? What do you know about my culture? You're born and raised here, you know? Like, I said, Mom, there's nothing wrong with your culture. You're, you're all here, same, and things like that. To me, when I hear these things, you know we're gonna be okay. You 
know, no matter what happens with the economy and what's not, you know, we're going to be okay. Okay, there we go. So that's my favorite subject. Why, why, why positive growth? Why personal growth? Why not talk about uh, happiness? I, I don't know, like, how many, I, I wonder, uh, does anyone want to share, you know, like, about your growth? What have you learned? If some I know by faces, I judge that you're coming from a different world. Is it anything that you can share and say, okay, this is what I learned when I was here, like struggling? Anything? For somebody who's been here for two years, I give you a pass, okay? <laughs> <laughs> You don't know much about me, but one thing uh, I came when I left my country and I was I was forced to leave, or I would be killed, among other things, before I would be killed. Um, I um, I didn't know there were choice available. I was raised in communist country, you know, and everything that I did on my own uh, had to be uh, in. <laughs> not known to others. <laughs> it mm. had to happen in hiding. Right. So there was no choice. The only choice was, you know, like to, I don't know, I don't even know how. And when I, when I left and when I um, said to somebody, um, well, I had no choice. And the person looked at me and said, what do you mean you had no choice? And then I started to re like, yeah, actually, I did have a choice. I had a choice to stay. I mean, I didn't. I didn't choose that. I chose to leave. I chose life. And once when you choose life and you choose new beginning, you hopefully will feel responsible for that and do something about that. So post-traumatic growth really happens in times of, of the struggle, in times of, of, of trauma, in terms of times of um, Hard, hard times. Uh, yeah, like Seligman, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Seligman, he, he talks about, uh, he left the uh, theory of uh, happiness and, and uh, really talk more about post-traumatic growth, growth post-traumatic uh, transform, transformation. Um, uh, and all this great stuff that is more inclusive rather than um, just focusing on um, one thing that is um, trauma. So um, for people who are in work, yes? I'm just thinking, you know, as you're telling your story and how connected I feel to you when you tell your story, and I realize the value of sharing the stories, you know? Yes. That everybody yes. in the room, as you share your stories yeah. with others, you're building that connection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 exactly yeah. that, that's well that's in fact here. But um, again, um, it's uh, it is very. I mean, uh, sharing. I know a few more slides down. Uh, I, I was promising to because there are a few counselors here to just to refer a little bit on after this um, on uh, how can we connect better or differently with people in our, in, sitting across of, from us, um, people coming from different worlds, you know, how can we serve them better? So you don't need to be in a, in counselor's role to uh, be, um, uh, to actually uh, be a great listener or to have, uh, to share your world, world view, uh, to, to do stuff to, to help and another person to heal. Because as I said, it takes years and years, and it doesn't happen in the big chunks. It happens slowly, uh, but surely, for sure, if you have intent and if you're if you consciously making that choice to help yourself. So, as I said, joy comes from overall sense of well-being, belonging, attachments, diversity, flourishing. Uh, 
see, that's diversity and flourishing. It's, it's very, you, this is what the immigrants talking about. They talking about overcoming diversity. They not, they're not gonna tell you, um, you know, like, uh, oh, you know, like I accomplished this, or you know, I went to school there, you know, like they like, you know, it was hard then, but I did it, you know, <laughs> like and it's, they overcome something, you know, like they, it's great sense of accomplishment. And then what happens when they flourish? They go from, yes. What advice do you have for somebody? I know this person, he's from South Africa, and he came in 1991, and he was, did very well there. But due to, I guess, the revolution that was happening, he came to Canada. He, he's, two of his friends were killed, so he thought he, his life was eminently in danger. Mm -hmm. So he brought his family here, and he always tells me, you know, I came with two, three suitcases and no keys, had no keys to anything, which was a really difficult yeah. feeling for him because he was yeah. a guy that had always a lot of keys to everything. Well, he was not in charge anymore. You no, know, you know, he wasn't in charge. And he, um, but life in South Africa for him was wonderful. He loved it, and he pines for it all the time. So he's been in Canada, and he has been successful, but then he's had setbacks, first of all. Mm -hmm. He left a lot of money in South Africa. He wasn't able to take it out. Secondly, well, I don't know, after five or six years, his marriage fell apart. And a lot of marriages do, don't, don't survive uh, immigrating to a new country. And he's always pining for South Africa, even though he's here. But he goes to South Africa. The last visit was in Maine. He couldn't wait to come here back. So he's in this position where he doesn't feel he belongs in either country. Like he's yeah. in, the, in, in this, um, he's sort of, the plateau of his life was before 1991 and it's mm -hmm. never been that high. It's sort of, he's, he's, it's very difficult to work with that because he's always sort of comparing to mm -hmm. the glory days of South Africa, yeah. which do not exist yeah. anymore. And South yeah. Africa is a huge mm -hmm. turmoil right now. I mean, it's not even safe to travel there half the time, but he's still, living this picture yeah. of 19 yeah. whatever 91 yeah. and it's to get him out of there and, and be present he's not present he's, in a, in a, he's not present time he's somewhere in the past yeah and exactly lots yeah. of people uh, live in the past lots of yes. people some of just but answer. the past is what it was at all anymore but see uh yeah. one of my uh person that i interview had us uh, she couldn't she couldn't let that uh, similar feeling go until she went there and she experienced she went with those 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 hopes and all this glory all glory and then realized that everything was gone plus she's evolved to another person already exactly not the same person and, and that's when she could actually was able to make a step right. back and look at all of this and say wow what years i spent like running after something that actually doesn't exist it never exists. So much wasted time. <coughs> wasted time exactly. wanting something that's exactly. no longer there. But you know what we do? We, we yeah. build those ideas, you know, uh, ideals, you know, and we hang to them mm -hmm. because they, they serve a purpose, you know, they, they're comforting, you know, and, and, and then, as you said, they prevent us from moving forward and doing what we're supposed to do, creating And, and I'm always trying to move him forward. It, it's inevitable. Every conversation we have, he slips mm -hmm. back to South Africa. <laughs> but he's saying now, it's sorry for mentioning South Africa, he's always apologizing, yeah, yeah. but he still but. goes there. <laughs> yeah. And I'm telling, personally, I'm sick of it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like that old conversation. Yeah. But he it's an old conversation. It is gonna, you know, yeah. it's gonna be his choice, really. His choice. Uh, and I, I ha actually have right now somebody I'm working <laughs> with who, um, who's actually got a, a family here. And speaking about different country all the time, and and uh, and it's threatening his marriage, and this creates this connect with children, and uh, and it really came to the point that he's going to have to make some choices, so let it go, and and what's well, not. What happened? We were we were talking about uh, him separating from uh, making steps to separate from people negative people mm -hmm. because usually people who are in an in a old story they find people who are to also in old story so they story, yeah. support their own they, they, they do yeah. old story so they never have time to create new story um, so he's actually making these attempts you know like to um, uh, because how he then how we describe people that he socialized with uh, is really based on uh, I think quite negative 
There needs to be a workshop to get people out of that fixed program. At least I'd like to send this person to something where they can somehow change that way they're thinking. You know what, sometimes yeah. uh, some people just, this is their choice too, you know, like because uh, lots of people feel inadequate, you know, like to, to and it's lots of barriers, you know, it's lots of personal barriers, you know, like, and, you know, um, lots and lots of stuff that they, they don't want to go. They want to stay. They don't. not want to go. They're, they're, I will come to you, this lady first. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry. I was actually a little bit the same like your client. Yeah. Um, I love Belgium. I actually moved for my husband to be. Okay. So I kind of voluntarily came to Canada. But also, I didn't need to come. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm like in the middle, like in between. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The thing was, I loved my life in Belgium. I was super happy there. I have a lot of friends over there. I had a job. I got my master's degree there. I had a good future there. And I needed to say stop to that. So I came to Canada. And then there suddenly, there were no opportunities for me. <laughs> like nothing. And it took me years, now two years, to eventually get what I want. And it's still not what I want exactly, but it's step by step. However, I am still thinking about my country, and it doesn't really need to be like how I say it. Like, a, like I still sometimes talk to James about, oh, it's so nice, and I was in Belgium, I did this and that and that, and that's the person who I was. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the person who I was helped me to become who I am now. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm grieving now and I'm like crying, and, oh, I'm sitting in a couch like I am nobody here, then I would think, well, the person that I was in Belgium would not sit and cry there. I'm adventurous. Normally, I should have gone outside and I would have done this and this and this and that kind of like thinking who I was in Belgium just sometimes helped me go to come back and grow in who I am in Canada. Like it's, it, it, I do not let myself go that much in Belgium because sometimes it helps me get back in. Um, it's, it's like personal I think and I think if he constantly thinks back about South Africa, how much better it was there. It's a little bit his choice, but also he needs to find something here that keeps him here and that he can come back to. In some of his conversations, when he talks to people, they think he left two years ago. Then they find out it was 20 years yeah. ago. They think, yeah. oh my God. So, yeah. But it, yeah. it takes yeah. so long because when you loved it and your country where you were born and you actually had so much good experience of it, and then suddenly you need to go. Yeah. Like, even, even if it's not yes. for two friends that are killed or a husband that you meet. Um, it's it's so difficult to kind of let go what you actually love, and you can't get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can't always get it here. So he needs yeah. to like find something here that he loves even more than that Africa. Fulfills himself. That's a good tip. Yeah, because I love nature here, and Belgium is flat. I hate it. In that part, <laughs> I hate it. So I love nature. I always go in the mountains, and every time I go back to Belgium, I'm saying to my friends like, "What the hell?" Where are the trees? Where are, Where are the, the trees? trees? What, are, yeah. what are you guys doing here every weekend? I would be so bored actually now. So I kind of think now every time I come back from Canada, like, oh, I love the mountains. Yeah. Oh, I miss Grouse Mountain. I, I miss all yeah. of that. So when he kind of finds something here that he really yeah. loves, even if he would go back to Africa, I think he would be like, mm, I like that better in Canada. Yeah, I would like to go back to Canada. I don't Thank know if you that so helped. We're not. That is so much yeah, over it yeah. so everyone. Thank take you for forever. sharing. It's but it can, it can take forever. It's already two years and sometimes I'm still crying for him. <laughs> so yeah. Basically, you, you came for me, but you're staying for the nature. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so now you're in trouble. <laughs> you you wanted to say something. But, uh, you mentioned part of what I wanted to say is personal choice, right? Yes. It's, about, about, it's all about change, I think. Yes. Why should I change? That's the first question. I was somebody, yeah. I am nobody. Yeah. Nobody knows me, how, yeah. how can I yeah. prove myself? Yeah. Why should I prove myself? I'm yeah. comfortable. That's why immigrants yeah. have communication with their own yeah. nation, yeah. because yes. the yes. Other, that's, other side is not accepted, yeah. and I need to prove myself. Yes. Does it worse? I prove myself, and they put me down and down, criticize me, yeah. laugh at my accent? Me as preschool teacher, I worked here for 12 years. At the beginning, and even now, before, I was working with Vancouver. West Vancouver kids, oh, what? Okay, 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 never mind, never mind. You don't, yeah. don't understand. Have that I, you know I know two languages, yeah. you don't know. Yeah. Just make fun like this, because yeah. I wanted to learn. Yeah. I wanted to learn, and yes. I did not let 
be down. No, and that's, that's, that's really great. It's very challenging, yes. and the post-trauma grow yes. happen when, yes. um, I, again, I'll go back. I was somebody, I, just an example. I had many things, I, I had position, I had house, and I had family. I have nobody, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, everybody laughs at me. So I want to prove when there is a little light for the change, it opens the door. Yes. But if the society help immigrants with this little light, yes. they welcome. Yeah. They Thank change. you for sharing this. Thank this you. is very powerful. Another thing I want to say. Okay. I cannot say Yugoslavia is so bad. Why do you want to go there? Yeah. Iran is too bad. It's yeah. terrible. People are like this. Yeah. I compare this. When I work with parents, I compare this again. My child is black with a big nose, with a big mouth. The white child is a little nose, small blue eyes, but I love my child. Yeah. And they love their child. I don't have the right to tell them, you hate your child, my child is beautiful, or vice versa. I am not standing in their shoes. Yeah. Exactly. So you can speak only for yourself. The, only, only, yeah, the only thing that I expect from people, yeah. and they expect from us yeah. probably, respect yeah. their choice. Yes. yes. Thank okay. you for sharing this. I, I wanted to sh like, but you, you probed me with something and you said, you know, like nobody knows you. I, uh, my son knows this story very well. He was three and a half. Uh, he came from, in my journey, my grand journey, he came from states here, actually through South America, Latin America, states, Latin America, Canada. And um, West End, I, I lived for years there. And uh, we lived uh, as a family, anyway. So, I registered for all these classes, I could anything I could possibly, you know, with my broken English to come up with it. And um, people were noticing me there because I would stand at, uh, behind the door, you know, and watch him because, you know, like, protecting mom, you know, like, I think he is in danger for some reason, you know, because he's three and a half, you know. And uh, people noticed me. And I, I felt like you, I felt nobody noticed me. I'm invisible, you know, I'm absolutely invisible. But then one day I was passing community center going to pick him up and a person that worked in a community center looked at me just like passing and said, hi. And he said, this is a man. I mean, I hardly recognize him right now. It's many years after, you know, how he aged and stuff like that. And he said, hi. And I was thinking, what? <laughs> hi? Who? To whom? You know, I literally like that looking, was, did he say hi to me? Because no, there is no hi. There's no hello, you know? And, um, you know, and we, we, you're right, we make that choice and we push forward and we grow and we develop the change. We, we, we uh, nurture that, uh, our inner strengths, you know? Like, and we, 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 create new, we create new attachments. We know now, even if we came in this country with insecure attachment, we can learn, we can actually, um, consciously uh, pick people, pick uh, uh, events, pick, make choices that we actually relearn our old days and, and flourish. We literally have a chance if we want to make that choice. Um, thank you guys, that's fantastic. Um, I, I want to share this with people who... Uh, When you work with immigrants, do not underestimate anything. Always, those are the basics, because in a strength-based multicultural perspective, what's not. Safe space where context matters. Really, that's the, the, the zest of it. It's safe space is not just a safe room, you know, like with no noise. Safe space is when you are like when you feel like and I, I, I really thank you for sharing your experience. You know, uh, when you sit with somebody and, and that, that feeling and that connection is building, and, and you feel that this person is actually with you, and that person is is hearing you. This person is not judging you. This person is is here for you. Is it at an hour or ninety minutes or who cares how long? That time. That's what sphinx, safe space is, more than anything else. Encourage people to tell stories. Uh, uh, story, storytelling is really essential. Immigrants' unique meaning-making process. We all make meaning out of whatever happened to us. If we don't, 
I don't know how we would <laughs> make to the next day. We find excuses, we do this, this, this. But meaning making is really essential for people who are uprooted or voluntary or involuntary. Um, see, this, this culture infused counseling is really a BC slash Alberta connection. And it's a really beautiful work done by uh, Sandra Collins uh, and, and uh, Nancy Arthur. They're, they're great researchers, and um, they pointed out really that we need to uh, share our own worldview with clients and uh, accept clients' worldview. Like you were, you know, like it's your clients are like a little bit different, <laughs> more than a worldview there. But um, and the, 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 what she's saying, what they're saying is consider world world worldview, have agreement on goals and counseling. And, and build alliance, working alliance with the client. So counseling is no longer, you know, like passive sitting on a, on a, on a chair or, or a sofa. Counselors are advocates. Counselors are people who are making phone calls for you when you can't make them. If they're not, I'm not sure are they really there for you. If you need that, of course, you know, like that. it's all with the good consent and what's not. So yeah, counseling is, is, is changing uh, as well. Um, Exactly, like ask people, of course you're not going to ask them, you know, like where are in your acculturation, you know, they will probably look at you and say what you're talking about, you know, but you're going to ask them, okay, what is happening for you now, what, what has changed, you know, like since you came, you know, like what you, what you do in Berlin, enable you, your, yourself to introduce and discuss brothers or two, you know what it is, this is really when the counselor show up and doesn't even know where on the map is your country. Right. You know, that's not counselor for you. You know. Uh, you, you, people, we need to be educated. We need to uh, push ourselves to know more about other people if we want to go into talk to other cultures. Um, of course, expand your, your uh, definition of cultures and this is in what's nice. What's, uh, Oh, this is uh, um, Eva She She's she's fantastic young woman. Um, she is, uh, and I have a, a permission to say that she's a researcher and uh, she's a psychologist uh, and a PhD. Uh, she teaches at CTU actually in, in Alberta and at University of Calgary and what's not. She did fantastic work on uh, um, uh, uh, counseling, how to actually uh, create. Uh, counseling approach and how to connect with, uh, with uh, refugees and immigrants as well, but mostly refugees in, in a way that will work for them. So what, she's, uh, so what she found uh, most recently uh, is that refugees uh, place the importance on their counselors and often base their opinions of therapy on how they perceive the person who is supporting them. You know what? It may sound judgmental to some, but it's human. It's really human. Because what she did with another partner, a researcher, but they, they, they interviewed a large number of women and um, they recorded their experiences of counseling. And, and they, they come up with this uh, conclusion. And I, I, was, I was just I was thinking, wow, am I really moving that far in my acculturation because this doesn't sit well with me? But it's their lived experience, you know? Like, who am I to say that's not correct? It's correct for them, you know? Oh, there we go. <laughs> We're almost done. We're almost done. I don't know, I mean, I usually, I love conversation and stuff, uh, but um, I don't know, was it working? Was this working for you somewhat? Did you come up with anything that, uh, like discussions. Yeah. Is there anything in terms of? I would like to hand out about this stuff yes, because I, I didn't come with anything. Yeah, I, and I, yeah. I can't remember all yeah. this either. I did not print anything, but uh, I will have a. Maybe if we get you our email. Yes. It's in the next slide. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. I can buy like some of that information. Oh, there you do. Have you registered? Did you registered? Registered. Okay. Okay. Then I can just get it over yeah. here. Just to make, make a mark uh, by your name, and I will send you personal. 
Um, I will have a research resource. So Mars will be an arrow like this. Just put an arrow. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, is any, uh, yes. Uh, I have a question. As a counselor or social worker, as an immigrant, um, you, to me, you could be triggered more than some of yes, us who sit there because we don't have the experience. What, what would you recommend for self-care? And the other part, too, and this has to do with clients coming in, if somebody came in that was part of the reason you had to leave, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, what, is, what is that like for you? What would you do? You know, it really depends. I, I, uh, it really depends. Uh, I had a, because it's been 20 years since I left. So it took, as I said, it took me about 10 years to heal. Um, and um, yeah, I can be triggered easily. Uh, I can be triggered easily. What happened to me so far, uh, and, and uh, uh, hopefully, you know, thankfully, session is only 60 minutes. <laughs> But what happened is that my clients gave me feedback, because I always ask at the end of the session, you know, how was this for you, you know, is this working for you, do you, do you? And, and people tell me, yeah, I, I feel your passion, I feel you understand, you, I, I think, I feel you connect, you can, so that's where it comes from, you know. Um, but in terms of self-care, um, well, I, as I said, you know, like 10 years were really, Roller coaster. Uh, after that, uh, mindfulness, running, uh, meditating, and reading. And in all, I, I wrote about this in a counseling magazine, and I presented a psych psych uh, psychological um, third uh, annual psychological conference in Vancouver on similar uh, topic. Um, every time uh, I do that, it's. It does trigger me, even trigger me tonight. Mm -hmm. And I was preparing this morning and reading through, and I was just fine. But what happens is, in, it's when you have a group of people and they witness, you guys are witnessing my experience, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm witnessing yours and, and yours. Mm -hmm. So that's the power that I, I thrive on. Um, most of people in, in, a, on, in a chair would actually thrive on that too to share uh, and to be heard and to, to connect with the mild experience as well. That doesn't mean that it's gonna, it will always work. You know, I actually had once a, a, a just person told me over the phone what they're coming for, you know, and I didn't hesitate to refer because I knew it would be extremely hard for me to, to do that. And I was thinking, no, there is, you know, I appreciate that you pick me but I think it would be too hard for me. I didn't say that, and I said, you know what, I'm booked, but I can refer you to a great person, which I did, uh, and it worked for, for that person. But yeah, it's, it's tricky, uh, trick, triggering. In terms of social work, like why I started with a clip, and do we want to hear it again, that <coughs> clip, just to make you crack your laugh? Like, do you want it? <laughs> like, um, you, you know, you can leave if you want to, uh, but um, it's, uh, you know, immigrants like like non-immigrant, we all go through domestic violence. We all go through over-disciplining too much and uh, or too little, and making fun of ourselves and all this stuff. But um, I'm serious about my work. I there's one thing that separates family. immigrant families from the regular Canadian families. You know, doesn't matter where your parents are from. They weren't born in this country. They will whoop your ass when you're growing up. Just hold it. So, if you really want that presentation, guys, I can say it. Okay? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. In a second, this is more important than to hear you. Um, something that really, really helped me in everything, so that would be really good advice if you have immigrant clients. Um, I am in a Belgian association here in Vancouver, so even though Belgium, Belgium is so small, it has an association in Vancouver. And we're all Belgian people, all together, who have similar stories, who have similar experiences in Canada. And I chose to be even in the wards and of the association. We have such a good connection, even with those people, because we have a feeling that we understand each other, even sometimes more 
and when we understand, or that Canadian people would understand us. So when I talk to James about it, I have a feeling he understands, but he hasn't had the experience. And when you come from the same country, like Belgium or South Africa, maybe has an association too, you have you have a feeling, yeah, it's, it's, they know, like you have the same cultural background, you have maybe places that you visited together, or, you know, like we've all studied in Ghent, for example, and it's maybe something that they should look up if there is something like that and if they would maybe have a benefit from it to even check some people out that have the same experience. Well, that helped me. That's almost all my friends are Belgian here. Which is pretty <laughs> awkward sometimes because I'm in Canada. So, yeah, but that helps. Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm not a, a counselor, I'm a post-secondary educator, and um, <clears throat> some of the comments that you made tonight uh, reminded me in a, in a class fairly recently with some actually, I guess, voluntary and involuntary immigrants. There was a particular student coming from a conflict mm -hmm. um, situation. And there was a lot of intensity for her, about, uh, uh, talking about the, something uh, related to it, but not personally. More like versions of what happened mm. and how it may be viewed from a Canadian perspective, mm -hmm. from the media, from mm -hmm. news reports. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it was guilt or what, but mm -hmm. there was so much intensity she wanted to share with the class, certain mm -hmm. videos to say, look, this is what really happened. Yeah. You think this yeah. happened, but yeah. you think that on my yeah. side we did this, yeah. but you know, and. Yeah wanted to really incorporate this into her assignments and yeah. show us, yeah. you know, films and that. But it's helping me, you know, some of the, uh, the um, theories that yeah. you talked about and processes, Process, right? Yeah. Maybe um, guilt or just, yeah, yeah identity reconstruction, yeah. all that kind yeah. of thing that was happening. But I do feel there's a lot of applicability for educators oh, in what you're talking absolutely. about. And I hope you have a chance sometimes to share this with Thank teachers you. or, or post-secondary educators yeah. because it can really help us too to be supportive. I found in this case I when she when this particular learner wanted to incorporate mm -hmm. these this issue into all her assignments, mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. supported her in it. I thought yeah. it just That's feels important. Exactly. I, why would I say no? And you know, by the end of the class there was less intensity yeah. about it. Yeah. So there seemed yeah. to have been some kind of Process well, there. it's personal. It's yeah. lived her lived experience. Right, of course. You know, nobody yeah. can relate to that. Yeah. It's her li lived yeah. experience, and it's still high up. Yeah. You know, yeah. like it's Hopefully. nowhere near process. Yeah. You know, like, and it's personal. It, it, yeah. People feel protected, and yeah. we often talk about media and how we're perceived in, in the media. You mm -hmm. know, like, I mean, you we can it's just a tip that's mm -hmm. really going on. You know, we don't really know. You you meet it. Mm -hmm. I mean, now I say we don't need, see, see that how acculturation happens, yeah. 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 you know, like I say we don't even, mm -hmm. who are we, you know, like I, I, I've often shared a story, my, my son is there, like um, uh, 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 the story of uh, uh, him being bullied in school, and mm -hmm. he probably wasn't even bullied, but he was the tiniest kid and I perceived that somebody would be on him, and he would tell me, and I said, Michael, because he would, he would, he would I mean, I saw it myself, mm -hmm. and I would say, you have to stand up for yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to mm -hmm. do this, 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 and he would look at me, because he was schooled, and he's already in, in elementary school, and, mm -hmm. and he looked at me, and he said, Mom, we don't do that. He said, who, who are we? Who are we? I'm mm -hmm. talking to you. <laughs> who are we? Mm -hmm. Who are we? We are our school system, society. He is already merged in different world. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't mm -hmm. survive if I didn't stood up for myself and be that other kid up. You know, mm -hmm. like there's no way that I could survive. You know, but he could. He had somebody to go to and somebody to tell him, mm -hmm. tell, and, mm -hmm. and somebody could actually help him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I could only be encouraged the same that I tried to encourage him. Stand up for yourself. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the parents are putting their values on the children. And exactly. The children are getting in trouble because mom well, said to do exactly. this or dad. Exactly. It, yeah, exactly. Had that happen. No question <laughs> of, about that, for sure. He knows how much trouble he got in. <laughs> okay. Anyone else want to share anything? Okay, I thank you so much. Uh, I thank you. I will have this 
on my website and uh, and um, and uh, I will email it to whoever makes a mark by their names. Okay, so you don't need oh, to yeah. go website to 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 look for it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you very much, Susanna. It's very, very informative and just really gives us a better inside perspective and more empathy as well as some interesting tools, right? Language around it. Yes. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you everyone for sharing. It's good enough. Yes. I learned something. What did you learn?